So hi everyone, uh, my name is Ben, and uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, animations, as you can tell from this extremely funny slide. So we'll see a few examples um, of how animations can uh, improve the user experience, and then we'll talk a little bit about the code behind uh, some of these animations. So very briefly, uh, I'm a user interface designer and front-end developer at Stripe. Uh, you might have seen that animations usually play a pretty big role uh, in our products, and uh, well, that's something I really like to uh, be involved in. I've been passionate um, with animations for quite a while now, and if my memory serves, it all started with the portfolio of my friend Tim. It was like six years ago, um, and WebKit was just uh, starting to support CSS transitions, and Tim made this little VCAT website where he used a, um, a CSS transition to produce that uh, little hover effect. I remember being blown away by this magical new uh, transition property, not only because uh, it was so easy to use, but also because it was performing transition to the new specific value and then automatically another one to come back to uh, the initial state. I was extremely excited, to say the least. Um, now, in hindsight, visualizing a simplified example of this animation makes you realize it wasn't exactly the most mind-blowing stuff ever, right? But at that time, uh, it really felt revolutionary to me. And I literally started to animate everything I could find. Uh, it was my obscure flashlight period where I wasn't even thinking if um, animating all the things was actually a good idea. I was just way too excited for not doing it. So yeah, six years ago, I also made some kind of VCAT website. Now, don't even ask me what this kind of box actually is, I have no idea. Uh, don't ask me why it produces like, smoke and stuff, I just don't know. Uh, I was way too excited um, to just you know, play with uh, animations uh, to even think about that. Uh, now imagine how I felt when the guy who got me excited about animations in the first place uh, made this tweet. <laughs> so. Uh, I got even more excited about animations, uh, and so I continued um, animating all the things, but I tried to be a bit more subtle. Um, so this one was for a small teaser page uh, for a product uh, that I, I, I've been working on called uh, Kickoff. And um, this one was already a bit better because it was fast, and so it wasn't delaying uh, uh, the access to the content. It was just bringing some motion to a static uh, visual. And so I continued with the same idea of um, uh, making my visuals a little bit richer by bringing some, uh, some motion uh, into the whole thing. So I redesigned my portfolio, uh, and instead of just showing static screenshots of all my icons and user interfaces, I chose to animate all of them in order to make the whole experience a bit more interesting. So, uh, I actually learned a lot from uh, doing this redesign uh, a few years ago, and pretty much all the best practices that I'm using today to create uh, good animations come from um, that experience. So, very briefly, what are these best practices? So the first rule um, is the most important one, and yet, unfortunately, the most complicated one to follow. But a fact that is hard shouldn't make you feel it's fine to uh, make some exceptions. Having just one part of your animation that doesn't run at 60 FPS is basically going to kill the entire smoothness of the animation, not just for that specific part. Um, the, the human eye is unfortunately extremely sensitive at that, and so if you can't code uh, the idea that you had in mind just by using opacity and transform, it's better to try to find another idea than using expensive properties like, let's say, width and height, for example. Uh, the other rules are fairly straightforward. Um, keep your animations fast. Animate things independently, so in, instead of like moving one big block, it's better to move uh, all its children uh, separately. And last but not least, always uh, use custom easings, so please, no standard uh, CSS keywords such as easy in, ease out, etc. So, knowing the techniques to create nice animations is just as important 
as knowing why and when to use animations. And of course, bringing, uh, bringing some fun to your application is a good argument per se. We should not overanalyze it. But still, the two main reasons for me for animating things is one, animation uh, help understanding the flow between two states, and two, animations can actually make your app feel faster. All right, so let's just start by illustrating the first point very quickly. Um, so this is a mobile version uh, of Checkout, which is Stripe's uh, embeddable payment form. So Checkout has this option that lets you uh, remember, like save your credit card info so you don't have to re-enter them over and over again. Now, enabling Remember Me uh, actually brings you to a completely new view, and you sort of lose the context. So by animating uh, each part individually, the flow becomes much more obvious, and you get a better sense of the structure of the page and about the elements composing the interface. Let's now illustrate a second point, which must, might be less obvious, um, as an animation can actually make your app feel slower um, when used in a wrong way. So, Dribbox is a small uh, side product I made like a year ago or so um, that lets designers create their portfolio easily based on their Dribbble profile. So, um, the background image here uh, is actually using Dribbble's API. So what it does is that it calls the API, then it fetches the current uh, popular shots, it draws all of them in canvas, and then it applies a gradient with a blending mode above everything. So the whole thing there takes a little bit of time, uh, especially, obviously, uh, loading all the shots. But I didn't want to have some sort of loader there, right? It, it's, it's super gross to delay the access to the content for uh, a background image, basically. So what I did instead was to create this tiny animation where the letters uh, sort of bounce, you know, because it's, it's dribble. Um, and by the time the animation finishes, the header will usually be fully or at least mostly loaded. The trick is that you don't feel like you've been waiting at all, even though the, 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 the actual um, loading time is exactly the same. Another example uh, with Checkout that has this option that I mentioned earlier that lets you save your uh, payment info. So you just um, mention your uh, phone number, you hit pay, and basically that's all. Uh, there's, no, there's no password or whatever. Now, the interesting part is when you actually reach, uh, when you actually use another device, such as, um, in this case, my mobile phone. So I just start by typing my uh, email address and then Stripe recognizes it as uh, a Stripe account, so it sends me automatically a verification code with a text message. So I just um, enter the four digits, and I find my payment form pre-filled with my credit card info without any kind of password, et cetera. So that's a pretty nifty process, if you ask me, but I'm just showing you this flow in order to um, focus on one specific part uh, of the, this entire thing. So have a look at the bottom of the screen there where it says sending code. So you have uh, the spinner and then send and then a confirmation message. So this whole animation there is actually, actually a lie. We have no idea when the message has been sent. Um, so why do we do that? Like, why do we lie to our uh, customers? Well, it's exactly the same principle as with Dribbox. There's always a small delay before the text message actually gets delivered. And so by the time the animation finishes, the probability that the, the message actually gets delivered is way higher. And even in the case where the message comes before the end of the animation, the reaction is often, oh my god, it went actually faster than they expected. So the point of all of this is that um, the actual performance of your application and the perception of your users are two completely separate things. And of course, the only thing that truly matters is the perception, and that's exactly why, uh, where you should put your efforts on. So to continue a little bit on checkout, a big part of the reason why we chose to go for uh, a CSS animation here instead of using a real video was, again, the speed. Loading all the assets for um, the entire animation is extremely fast, while having the same thing as a real video, which would be retina-friendly, etc., would be extremely heavy and slow to load. 
And of course, using a CSS animation also comes with a lot of other benefits, such as being super easy to edit, um, uh, you can be like SEO friendly, you can make some part of the animations responsive if you want. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of benefits of using uh, a CSS animation. So, I'd like to focus again uh, on a tiny part of this page and explain how this small um, bouncing arrow works. I know it looks trivial, um, but most of the time this, uh, these animations look completely off because the wrong approach is used. So let me just uh, simplify this example in order to focus on the uh, actual animation and not the visuals. So most of the time what people try to do um, is to apply a custom cubic Bezier curve on the entire animation declaration, and then they try to tweak the values inside the keyframes in order to reach natural bounds. Well, it turns out it's pretty much impossible to reach something that feels just right this way. So what you want to do instead is to um, use two completely different and opposite easings inside the animation. So you want the, the square to accelerate as it goes to the left and decelerate, decelerate as it goes to the right. So instead of applying a custom cubic basic curve on the animation declaration, we're just going to keep it linear. What, what's interesting here is that we can actually change and switch the uh, timing functions inside the keyframes. So from zero to 50% uh, of the animation, we're going to use um, an ISO timing function, so the square uh, decelerates. And then from the middle of the animation uh, to the end of the animation, uh, so for the square to come back to its initial state, we are going to switch and use um, an easing timing function, so the square uh, accelerates. That way we're not trying to fake the correct easings, uh, they are actually accurate. Now this kind of bouncy animation is pretty popular these days, uh, and rightly so, it often makes your um, your animations uh, look a bit more natural. So a quick example here with this uh, white box that sort of bounces a little bit before uh, it disappears. And then there's another bounce which is slightly less visible here uh, on the yellow selection. So, yeah, and, uh, another example um, with this uh, bouncy animation as you hover the thumbnails. Now, writing keyframes, every time you want to produce that tiny bounce effect, is super annoying, right? You have to first uh, name your keyframes, which is, as we all know, the most complicated issue in computer science. Um, you, you have to write the actual keyframes and then use them uh, as an animation, which makes the whole syntax not super friendly, especially since most browsers still require vendor prefixes, etc. So when you can, you really want to use uh, transitions instead of animations. Turns out Evangelina explained this whole topic earlier better than I could ever do, so I'll be quick, but um, Cubic Basic Curve allows us to just do that by specifying, specifying values above one. Um, so in this case, the last value is 1.2, which is represented on the graph by this curve that goes above the top limit, and that creates that kind of bounce effect. Now keep in mind that um, this is sort of a hack, as you're not creating something perfectly accurate. But for simple animations, uh, it, it's an accept acceptable trade-off. All right, so let's move on to the next example. Um, so this is the landing page that we used to announce our Bitcoin support. So this animation shows the purchasing experience and the way you integrate it in your product, which is basically just um, a data attribute. So, yeah, I had a lot of um, uh, recreating Vim there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to focus again on uh, just one specific part of this animation in order to cover a few general techniques um, and principles. So first of all, and sorry about that, I know it's CSSConf, but I'd like to highlight the fact that in most cases CSS won't be enough, you'll actually need JavaScript. CSS is the best rendering engine for uh, animations, and you should rely on CSS as much as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, 
it's possible to create perfectly smooth animations um, in JavaScript, in most cases using request animation frame, but in some cases, like having multiple HTTP requests during your animation, well, JavaScript won't be able to give you 60 FPS all the time. And that's exactly where, where, um, where CSS shines. By running all your animations on a separate thread, you're pretty sure to get 60 FPS all the time, even if you have multiple network access, if you, even if you have heavy DOM manipulation during your animations. Now, JavaScript will actually be very useful for creating and running these CSS animations. So why is that? Well, first, you have access to events. So by using uh, transition end and the animation end events, you are actually creating a real sequence of animations. Otherwise, you would have to fake the sequence by using manual delays everywhere, which is not maintainable, especially in a pretty big animation such as the, the beacon one. Another important point, um, it's very easy in JavaScript, of course, to define uh, random delays, uh, random, random values, basically, that you can use everywhere. Which leads me to the third, uh, the third and most important point, is that by using um, JavaScript, you're actually sort of forced to create better results. All right, so let's take a small example um, from the beacon I, animation I showed you earlier to illustrate these points. So the small example I'd like to cover uh, is this animation on the text that explains what's going on on the right. So it uses the same uh, animation first to appear on the screen and then to switch to um, the next slide. So the principle is pretty straightforward. You, you want to uh, wrap each letter of the text in a separate element, and then you want to apply the same transition from opacity 0 to 1 with a slightly different delay for each element. Of course, doing that by hand would be pretty much impossible, as, and that's exactly why you want to use uh, something like JavaScript. So let's see how it works under the hood. So first, um, I'm defining a function called uh, wrap letters. So in case you are not familiar uh, with the syntax, I'm using the new version of ECMAScript here. Um, I strongly encourage you to take the plunge and uh, to embrace it today, not only because it's more powerful, but because it can make your code uh, much cleaner. It's, uh, it's very easy to use. You can use transpilers like Babel to support other browsers, etc. So there's literally no, no valid reason for uh, avoiding it today. Anyway, so this function uh, takes a, a DOM element and it retrieves its text content. Then it splits the entire sentence into an array of words. And for each word found in this array, it's going to create a span element with a letter class. Then it just has to uh, concatenate all the elements in the array into a big string. And finally, it just has to replace the, uh, the content of the original DOM element by this big string of span elements. So initially, the HTML source code for uh, this text was looking like this, super simple, just a title and a paragraph. Now the final generated DOM resulting from uh, the script we've just explained looks like this. And you can see that all the letters from it just takes, blah, blah, uh, are now wrapped into separate elements. Cool, so now that we have uh, each letter wrapped uh, in a span, we just want to apply the same transition on all, the all these elements. So we just start by selecting these elements, and then we create a loop. And inside the loop, we are just going to multiply the index inside the loop by a specified delay, which is uh, 10 milliseconds in this case, so the first element won't have any delay at all, and then it's going to be 10 milliseconds, and then 20, and then 30, etc. And that's basically all. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Now, writing a lot of code like this is pretty annoying, and honestly, I've seen myself many times uh, trying to convince myself that uh, an animation idea that I had in mind was actually terrible, blah, blah, just because I was way too lazy to write the actual code for trying this animation. So in order to fight my uh, natural laziness, I wrote this tiny helper uh, that does a bunch of things. Like you don't have to select uh, elements and then loop over them, etc. You can just pass in a CSS selector. It accepts uh, unitless values. It automatically listens for transition end events. And it also sort of promotes best practices by allowing you to only animate opacity and transform related functions. 
So I strongly encourage you to use a library like uh, my Animate Helper here, or basically anything that won't prevent you from exploring new ideas just because the code you would have to write is painful. Use tools, make your life easier. The web is, is hard enough. And if it's hard for you to produce the, the idea that you had in mind, that's bad. Code, the code should never hurt your creativity. It should give like superpowers to your creativity instead. OK, so um, the last thing I want to briefly talk about is uh, how to bring a little bit of uh, depth into your animations. So in the real world, uh, nothing is flat, obviously. And I think that losing, in, uh, that, losing that, that component in uh, software design is an unfortunate oversimplification. 3D actually helps a lot understanding how objects behave and how they relate to each other. So it seems to me like a good idea to uh, get inspired by the real world to build our apps. No, we tried that before, right? Remember that horrible trend where we were trying to imitate real-life objects into our apps? That's kind of the same thing as I just suggested for uh, animations, right? Well, no, it's not. Copying a real-life object and a specific visual style is fundamentally wrong, as our tools constantly evolve. Most of the things that we are using today didn't exist uh, 100 years ago and will eventually disappear. But physics, that's not going to change, right? Um, it's not a trend, it's not something related to a specific period of your life. Uh, and I think it's safe to assume that, that, to assume that physics are not to radically change in the foreseeable future. So, let's just see two uh, quick examples um, of how a subtle 3D effect can improve a little bit your interface. So the first one um, is this shaking window. So this, this kind of shaking animation is not right. It's not, it's not, it's not new, right? Um, but the, what I like about this one is that it also has this subtle 3D rotation. So when we use this kind of like shaking animation, um, it, it sort of imitates the movement that we do with our head when we say no, right? And so I think it's interesting here to go the extra mile and also imitate the actual rotation that we do with our head. So, another example um, with this animation, as you enable Remember Me. So the block that appears and disappears uh, when you toggle the checkbox is kind of unfolding from this section, and the 3D effect here really amplifies that behavior and consolidates the relationship between these elements. So let me simplify again this animation in order to uh, focus on the interesting part, which is the 3D transform. Uh, well, the gray looks like white here, but whatever. Um, so by default, what we want to do is to rotate the bottom part in 3D and then cancel the transform when the checkbox is selected. So let's start. Uh, with the HTML, which is super basic, uh, we are just using two labels, one for the Remember Me checkbox, and then another one for the phone number. The JavaScript part is also super simple. Uh, we just attach a click event to the checkbox, and we toggle an active class to the bottom part when the checkbox is selected. Super straightforward. Now, the interesting part is uh, the CSS, obviously. Um, so by default, the whole block uh, gets rotated by minus the quarter of a turn, uh, which is minus 90 degrees. Um, so if you visualize it in 3D, it's now perfectly flat. So you, you basically, you don't see it. Um, so we also apply a transition. Uh, and then we cancel the, the transform when the active class gets applied to um, the phone idea. So let's see how it looks. It sort of works, uh, but the transformation is applied from the center of the element, which is a good default in most cases. But in this specific case, that's not what we want. So we just have to change the transform origin. So we force the rotation to start at the very top of the element instead. And that's all, we have our nifty 3D unfolding animation. 
So the last device I want to share with you um, is the most important one in my opinion. Don't forget that having fun at what you do is the best way to produce great results. Go the extra mile, play, experiment, and be happy with what you do. Thank you very much.